Laura Putkema is a journalist and writer who strives to highlight solutions in urban development and planning. Working within the intersection of cities and climate change, she's created Parcity Patery, a blog that discusses participatory urban planning approaches from across the world and how readers can apply these lessons in their own communities. Laura's presentation highlights urban planning approaches in various cities and how we can all learn from these to create sustainable neighbourhoods in our own communities. Good morning, good evening. I'm in London, so here it's only 9.30 a.m. Um, I will be speaking about how to create more sustainable neighbourhoods and I will start out by giving a bit of a journalistic perspective on the different narratives that we have on um, what climate change looks like in cities today. Because what I find so interesting is that there, well, I identify three different um, narratives. One is cities as victims, another is cities as villains in terms of climate change, and the third and most interesting one I think is cities as visionaries, which also goes towards the question of um, how to create more sustainable neighborhoods, and I will in the end give some recommendations on what to do, maybe professionally, but also on a very personal level. So I think regardless of our profession, we all need to um, come away from events such as this with a few pointers, a few new ideas and maybe what to change in our everyday life or what to ask of companies, of politicians, etc. Um, so you will all have seen coverage on cities as the victims of climate change. There's bushfires, there's rising sea levels. Most of the, the great capitals of the world are actually located close to the water, so rising sea levels are a particularly big concern but also other extreme weather events, uh, floods, droughts, storms, and many more have been more and more frequent. So there's air pollution as well. It's a big danger, for example, in New Delhi, cities like that, where there's more and more people dying of the consequences of air pollution. And then we've also got the loss of natural resources and green space and ecosystems, as we've just seen as well. So a question, if you'd like to post a quick comment in, in the chat, that would be interesting if you could say, where's your city and um, what's your city and how is climate change affecting your city? Maybe what have you seen recently? My example is London, because I'm based here and especially this year, but also the last few years, we've had more and more droughts. So some of the beautiful parks, this is Greenwich Park, for example, are turning into a straw pretty much. It's really dangerous also in terms of the risk of fires. This year alone, there have been dozens of fires in cities such as London, which is what people had never expected, I think. Um, loss of biodiversity, a danger to human lives, but also to animals and all other kinds of you know, the flora and fauna. And then you'll see in press coverage how cities are portrayed as victims of this, but they're also villains. So cities contribute contribute a lot to climate change. 75% of global CO2 emissions come from cities. So cities suffer the most from climate change, but they also contribute the most to climate change. Um, the transport sector, but also the buildings and construction sector are the key contaminators here. And I think especially in construction, that's a sector that gets overlooked a little bit. Not a lot of people are pointing a finger at construction and saying, hey, you, you're contributing to climate change, but they actually do in large, large numbers. And this kind of pollution and CO2 emission then leads to things such as the urban heat island effect, which means that often cities are three to four degrees Celsius uh, warmer than the surrounding areas, which in turn leads to uh, difficulties for older people, for more vulnerable people, for the flora and fauna. Again, um, it will trap a contamination within the city and there's lots of other negative effects to this urban heat island effect. And as usual, it's uh, sadly the poorest parts of the population that are the most affected from urban heat islands, but also from other negative uh, climate change effects in cities. If you look at many, especially African cities, um, you will see that the people that can afford to move further and further away, for example, from the coast, where the risk of flooding is increasing, meaning that those people who cannot afford to move to safer areas, they're forced to build um, usually informal settlements close to the coast, very, very simply speaking, but then they're the most in danger, but at the same time, they contribute the least to climate change because they barely create any CO2 emissions. So again, the question to either post in the chat, if you'd like to, or just think about, maybe take home with you is um, how does your own city maybe contribute to climate change that you know of? It's also really interesting to look into this a little bit, try to find out what's going on, what's the most polluting sector in your own city. And then again, in, in London, one of the sectors that I personally for a long time wasn't really aware of is waste. There's food waste in cities um, that contributes to all kinds of things, but food waste and uh, 
overall waste recollection in cities is becoming a big, big issue. So in London, we've got a lot of different private providers of waste recollection, but somehow they're overlapping or there's none of them at all. And there's waste in many parts of the city, which you might not expect. There's a lot of foxes because of that. They bring diseases with them to the city. The sewage gets contaminated from waste when it rains and landfills are another issue. So Mm, this is mostly to point out that in terms of what cities do as villains in climate change, it's not just the kind of typical things that you might think about, such as factories, maybe. It's also issues such as waste, how we live, what we eat. But then in terms of how to create more sustainable neighborhoods, I think we should look and focus a bit on what cities can contribute in terms of knowledge, in terms of ins inspiring projects, maybe. So this third narrative about cities is cities as visionaries. We've got um, political frameworks such as the new urban agenda that most countries in the world agree to. It means that by 2030, they want to do their best to fulfill the goals, the very ambitious goals of sustainable development goal number 11 for more sustainable cities. There's the Paris Agreement uh, to re reduce the effects of climate change to hopefully stay within the 1.5 degree global warming limit, let's say. Then there's um, organizations such as the C40 Convention of Mayors, they have a lot of interesting projects. Um, there's SDG 13 that's closely related to climate change in cities and everywhere else as well. But this focuses on climate action. And then each city, again, it's interesting to have a look at whether your own city has this, is supposed to develop a local agenda detailing for um, the year 2030, what actions will be taken and how it will be possible to make the city more sustainable. Because this looks very different depending on your context. So as you can see, on many different levels, there's many different frameworks as well. So that kind of explains in very broad terms of why it's so complicated to make our cities more sustainable as well. I mean, so it can be just very confusing. Another element that is, I think, very interesting and very popular in the media as well are smart cities. Uh, this usually makes us, makes us think of high-tech cities. I think Korean cities are a particularly good example for this. London is also a smart city. Melbourne is a very smart city. But I think smart cities does not only just mean um, how well connected you are technologically or whether you provide free Wi-Fi to your citizens or not. It also comes down to how socially smart and environmentally smart a city is. Uh, so again, I'm just inviting you to have a look maybe after this webinar if you're interested at your own city and see whether it's, it can be considered smart in certain dimensions at least. And you might be surprised because I think a lot of modern cities are pretty smart already. Many cities have either an adaptation or a mitigation strategy or both. Um, adaptation meaning that there's steps being taken to adapt to the consequences of climate change and become better and more flexible versus mitigation, which means that the effects of climate change themselves are being uh, suppressed in a way wherever possible, the, yeah, in the end, all leading towards the reduction of CO2. And yes, have a look at what solutions your own city is providing, because these can be really inspiring. There's lots of hope there, and I think there's lots of ideas coming from other cities that can then be adapted to a local context. You can see a few in this image here. Climate smart forestry, river restoration in any city that's close to the water. The water will play a big role on how to handle climate change in that city, whether it's the ocean or a river or just a big lake. Uh, peatland restoration, particularly important in areas that have peatlands. Um, green cities, almost every city can do something on that front. So there's lots and lots of ideas. I think that's not, it's not the challenge that we don't have enough ideas. It's how to pick the right ideas, how to fund them financially and how to implement them with the support of politicians in your own city. Uh, so in my example here in London, there's a strategy to become, to become carbon neutral by 2030. The strategy is from 2018 and it was moved forward from the 2050 deadline. So politicians actually decided, no, 2050 is not good enough. We need to be able to manage this by 2030. It is honestly not looking like they're going to manage it by 2030. But at the same time, I think it's good to have tough deadlines and be as strict as possible. And then if it's 2032, 2035, that's not ideal, but it's still much better than 2050. Um, I think sh cities should have visions, being visionaries, on topics such as diet that ties back to the food waste, energy, waste overall, also in terms of, for example, the circular economy, looking at how we can recycle our resources, maybe use them to create energy and not also not just not to produce as much waste as we do. Transport, of course, is a big sector for lots of innovative projects. 
And we also need to think about, in terms of adaptation and also mitigation, what to do with extreme weather events, how to prepare for them, how to become more resilient. Um, this also re requires changes in individual behaviors, behaviors, but also in organizational behaviors. And I think private companies in particular can do a lot if they get forced to do a lot. So there's um, well, just some food for thought on where the biggest change can be created, how it can be created, and how politics can support that, but also how individuals can push for that and ask for that. Uh, here in London, there's a focus on adaptation rather than mitigation, although this will also depend on your individual city. And here I've got some examples just from all over the world to showcase more of this idea that cities can be visionaries and that we can inspire, be inspired by each other. So in Singapore, for example, there's a really innovative water reuse system. Most of the city's rooftops uh, are designed in such a way, especially the newer buildings, that they can collect water. So all the rainwater water is actually captured and used and reintroduced into the water cycle, meaning that this becomes a really circular economy, at least a circular eco uh, water economy, um, saving the city a lot of resources and just showcasing how it's possible to have a circular use of resources. They are also doing solar harvesting and lots of other things. Um, but sometimes it makes sense, I think, to look at one particular resource and one such as important as water is, um, well, is key for learning, I think, from a city such as Singapore. We've got Freetown in Sierra Leone in Africa. That is a city that committed to planting one million trees by 2020. There was a bit of a holdup due to the COVID pandemic, but they managed by now. Um, they also pledged to, to not have any more Christmas tree display, uh, displays in the city. So now they're using more eco-friendly, I think, LED lighting. I put a link in here as well. I think you'll be given the presentations afterwards so you can read more on these examples. Um, I lived in Mexico for a while and there I saw something that at first impressed me, but then I looked into it and I saw that it's visionary optically, but maybe if you dig a little bit deeper, not as much. So this is something called the Via Verde. This is a gigantic highway in the middle of the city and they have these green pillars. So they, they greened all the concrete surrounding the highway pretty much, especially on the pillars. And they promise to really clean the air of the surrounding area. But um, based on the numbers, I think this does not even clean the CO2 that the cars that pass by there actually emit. Um, so it's it's quite co controversial by now. It also requires a lot of effort just to water these plants. I still think it has a lot of value. It's such a visual thing. Everyone who passes by there knows and everyone pauses for a moment and thinks about, oh, yes, I'm one of the most polluted uh, streets in Mexico City. And what can we do? But I think we also need to tell people that this is by far not enough. It's a start, maybe. And it's something that kind of tickles people a little bit and raises their awareness. Um, but it's not necessarily a solution we should implement in other cities. So I also wanted to give you a more, uh, I, oh, sorry, a diverse idea of what can be done and what maybe should not be done necessarily. Um, here in, in Europe, in Copenhagen, um, we've got a city that's particularly good at transport, I think. So by 2025 already, they want their whole fleet to be carbon neutral and also um, electrifying the buses which contributes to the carbon neutrality of public transport in Copenhagen. The city center is already pedestrianized. There's lots of bike lanes. More and more bike lanes came about during the COVID pandemic as well. And um, well, there's more to read online, but I think if you've heard of Jan Giel, he is from Copenhagen. He's very, very particularly responsible for this. He's an inspiring architect and urban planner. So it's worth looking at his books as well for examples and ideas on how to create better, more sustainable cities. And lastly, but you will probably also know this better than me, <laughs> Melbourne, I think, is a good example of a very committed government in terms of climate change in the city. So Melbourne makes space very explicitly for large climate demonstrations, large climate strikes. I think there's incentives to actually support this. And that's another way of how to create a better city, this, this cooperation with the government and the government actively supporting something that in other cities might be a bit frowned upon. Uh, which is initiatives such as Friday for Future, I think is really, really key as well. Plus there's all these other benefits such as participation and enabling citizens to, to speak their opinion and voice their concerns. So there you have uh, <laughs> some ideas on sustainable neighborhoods and on in terms of how to actually create them, what are the different elements? Um, 
there's lots of them. There's lots of them, and it always depends, I think, on your own city. But the idea is that there's a bit of a building, like a box of building blocks, let's say, and then it makes sense to think about what are the particular challenges in your city and which solutions could be applied. One of them is sponge cities. That means when it rains a lot in your city, this water gets absorbed. Um, it does not just end up on the concrete turning the streets into rivers, but actually gets reabsorbed into the system, into the groundwater and reused. Vertical and miniature forest, I think, are really interesting solution. Many cities are trying to become 15 or 20 minute cities where all of the necessary services are in walking distance. Um, they're easy to reach. Multimodal transport, such as in Copenhagen, where you can walk, you can cycle, you can take your bike on the train, you can then take a shared car to get somewhere else, for example. Um, that's very promising. Energy efficient housing, which got multiple and flexible uses. All of this is the housing area of urban planning. Affordable housing is also important. Some enabling citizen participation, which I think applies to every city. And there's lots of ideas coming from citizens as well that need to be taken into account in, terms in, in order to create a more sustainable neighborhood. Um, making neighborhoods safer, I think, especially for women, but also for all kinds of maybe minority groups or more vulnerable groups. And then really thinking about resilience in terms of climate change, but also socially. How can we be a more resilient society that kind of bumps back, jump, jumps back very quickly from any external shocks? And then, like I mentioned, the very personal component of this, I think, is firstly to advocate and make your voice heard. So if you're in Melbourne, for example, try to participate in these climate strikes. Um, if you're so inclined, of course, but that's a very good way of contributing to more sustainable neighborhoods and cities. You can, of course, make your own choices, such as more public and active transport, cutting consumption and waste, reducing energy use and respecting and protecting the green spaces and the ecosystems. And then also just sharing your ideas, I think, is really key. Lastly, I just wanted to show you in the sense of Jan Gehl, who I mentioned, this idea of first tackling the issue of of people of society, then looking at the places in the neighborhood and then looking at the more public spaces. That's a really interesting strategy in terms of creating a more sustainable neighborhood. So in, on the pictures, you can see my own local neighborhood here in, in North London. What they've done here is they started to do some community building. They started an Instagram channel, a Facebook group, and some informal gatherings on this little square that we have here to find out what people wanted, what was lacking in the neighborhood. We had some criminality here before. There were lots of foxes coming around eating the waste. They then started working on the public space that you can see on the lower picture. So this little triangular square became what's called a streetery because they got the license for surrounding restaurants to actually put their tables on the square and allow people to eat out there. And now they're working on beautifying and improving the individual buildings by painting facades and finding renters for the buildings. But I think this approach of first seeing what the people actually want, then providing a space where they can gather, enjoy and make the neighborhood safer and more livable, and then going back and looking at individual buildings is um, it's really key to creating sustainability because it starts with the people. It does not start with hey, let's paint this one building or let's do this one thing. It starts really at the base. And that's it from me. You can have a look at my blog if you're interested. And thank you very much for listening.